Welcome to the Own It Powercast, the place to be when you get serious about making big changes and accelerating growth in your life and in your relationships. Finally create the life you've always wanted, living life on your own terms. Learn how to take your fear and turn it into powerful choices that will create sustained change. Now your host, Mary Baker. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Own It Powercast, the place to come to get what you need to move yourself forward. Hey, it's Mary Baker, and welcome to episode 232, Why It's So Hard, Exploring How Your Family Shaped Your Boundaries. Welcome to a new month all about the family and how ours shaped us. I thought that since for many of us, it's the holiday season, so family's often top of mind either pleasantly or unpleasantly, or maybe a mix of both. And I know as a counselor and a coach that boundaries are a big topic we often get into during this time of year because that's when they're going to come up and get tested the most. It's a topic we talk about a lot on the show because they're like breathing when it comes to self-confidence and mental health, actually. We start the month talking about how your family may have struggled with healthy boundaries and why you might also, because our families are our first classrooms. Now, since boundaries is such a huge topic, and there's so many pieces to talk about here, we're going to cover this in two parts. Part two will be coming next week. But before we do, if you like what we're talking about here on the show, especially boundaries, think about taking the work a bit deeper and give yourself the gift of change. I have an online immersive course with 12 modules, all the pieces that you need to find your voice, get your confidence going, and start making some big changes in your life. It's a self-paced program along with some wonderful group coaching that'll give you the education, the system, and the support you need to create real change. The link is right there in the show notes. If you have any questions, please reach out. I answer every email and every message. Okay, so let's get into it. So several aspects within families can contribute to kids growing up without a clear understanding of what healthy boundaries are. So we're going to get into some of the biggest factors today. Some of them you may already be familiar with, some you may not. The most obvious one probably would be lack of modeling. So kids learn by observing the behavior of their parents and their caregivers and their older siblings. If the adults within their family struggle with setting and respecting boundaries, kids have no recourse but to adopt similar patterns. Now, what are some examples of this? Well, the first one is overly involved parenting. For example, a parent consistently invades the child's privacy, going through their personal belongings without permission, and not respecting their need for personal space. Now, this would pertain more to an older child or preteen or a teenager. Inconsistent boundaries are another culprit. So, for example, parents are inconsistently enforcing rules, so they allow a behavior one day and punish it the next. This inconsistency can really confuse children about what is acceptable, what isn't. It also creates a lot of anxiety for them and probably some shame because they think that maybe they're wrong or bad for thinking it was okay yesterday, and today it's not. Emotional enmeshment. Now, enmeshment is when the boundaries are blurred, and you can have a very kind, loving family and have it be very enmeshed and unhealthy. For example, a parent consistently shares inappropriate personal details or emotional burdens with the child treating them more like a friend than a child. This blurs the emotional boundaries between them and the child and also puts the child in a parental role and doesn't allow the child to just be an innocent kid. We're not supposed to put grown-up stuff on kids. And this will happen a lot when mom or dad will talk about the other parent and or other people in the family. So that just adds to the yuck. There's a failure to teach consent. For example, when parents ignore or dismiss a kid's discomfort with physical affection, 
insisting on hugs or kisses even when the kid expresses a desire to not engage in such physical contact. And this is really important when it comes to relatives and neighbors and friends and things like that, because you're giving them the message, you should let anyone kiss you, even if you don't want it. Don't pay attention to your own boundaries. Don't pay attention to your own feelings or your own needs. There's no detachment taught there either. Just because your Aunt Carol wants to give you a hug and squeeze you and kiss your face doesn't mean you want that. And that's okay. So there's a lack of communication boundaries. Like when parents openly argue or discuss adult stuff in front of young kids without explaining or setting appropriate communication boundaries. So this is taking some of the innocence away from a kid and kid developmentally can't process it in a healthy way. So it's a burden to them. It's really uncomfortable. They need to know that we're in charge in a healthy way, and that we have things taken care of. They don't need to share in the anxiety unless absolutely necessary. When there is a crisis, okay. But it would still be shared with the child appropriately in terms of what mom and dad decided that we need to do. Not asking the kid what we should do. There's a neglect of personal boundaries. So maybe the parents consistently interrupt the child's time alone or their private activities. There's a failure to acknowledge their needs at all. So parents may tend to prioritize their own needs consistently without considering or acknowledging the child's needs, leading the child to believe that personal boundaries are not important. And really loving parents can do this too. So for example, if mom is so focused on getting dinner on the table in time, and yes, that's important. She may not take a moment and listen to her kid talk about his day that really upset him. Another way that parents don't model healthy boundaries is permissive parenting, like allowing a child to engage in behaviors that are not age-appropriate or safe without setting appropriate limits. So there's a lack of structure, and this can lead to the kid struggling with self-discipline and understanding social norms. They got to know where the bumpers are. There's exposure to toxic relationships. This is pretty common, unfortunately, with parents with poor boundaries. So maybe kids witness their parents consistently tolerating disrespect or mistreatment from others without setting clear boundaries. So this normalizes it. This says, this is okay. This is what relationships are about. This is what conflict should look like when it shouldn't. Parents' inability to say no when they're consistently struggling to assertively say no or set limits with others, they're teaching their children that it's challenging or unacceptable to establish boundaries. They might even give the messaging that it's mean and selfish and uncaring. So it's really important to recognize that these are some examples and there's a million more. And you could have experienced some of those on a continuum of severity. And each family dynamic is unique. But what is most important to think about is kids internalize these behaviors. And they're probably going to replicate them in their own relationships. Unless they're exposed to alternative models and some healthy teaching around boundary setting. So another big area is enmeshment. So with families with enmeshed dynamics, individual boundaries are usually blurred or non-existent or non-existent or just lip services paid to them. Enmeshment occurs when there's an overly close or dependent relationship between family members, usually between all of them, and that really hinders the development of personal boundaries. There's a lack of privacy. So, for example, family members may have limited personal space. Maybe their bedrooms or personal belongings or conversations are not respected as private. So it leads to a sense of constant intrusion and leads to anxiety, this low-level, unnameable anxiety that kids can have. There's emotional fusion. So when people are overly involved in each other's emotional lives to the point where individual feelings become shared experiences. So a change in one member's mood significantly impacts the entire family. I'm sure some of you resonate with that. 
I've had so many clients tell me that it's hard for them to not take on the emotions of the other. It's hard for them to detach and say, that's how they feel. That's not how I feel. Because they probably grew up in a family that did what I just described, emotional fusion. Overdependence. Family members can rely excessively on one another for decision-making, problem-solving, or emotional support. Like calling your mom every day when you're an adult (laughs) is indicative of that kind of family. That's a lot. There's a lack of autonomy and individual members struggle to make independent choices. They do the polling. Well, what do you guys think I should do? Not that it's not great to check it out with people closest to us. But when we're looking to them for the decision, that's a problem. Role reversal is another aspect. This is when kids become parentified. They take on adult responsibilities like caring for their younger siblings in a chronic fashion, not just in a pinch, providing emotional support to parents, blurring those traditional roles and responsibilities within the family. They're not supposed to be their parents' emotional support. Parents are supposed to get that from other grown-ups. That is so important and so overlooked, I think. Especially for single parents who feel isolated, it's too hard. They have a captive audience. It's often very difficult to make sure that they don't share too much and they don't lean too much on their kids that they take responsibility for taking that grief, that stress, that whatever, to a support group or some good friends outside of the home. Because kids will naturally fill any vacuum that they come across in a family because they need the family to survive so that they can survive. So as grown-ups, it's our job not to leave vacuums if we can help it. With enmeshed families, you often see limited external relationships. They spend all their time together. So they may have fewer, no close relationships outside of the family unit. So the family becomes the sole source of emotional support, and it really creates a lack of diversity and social connections. And it, I think, inhibits, if not prohibits, growth for each individual family member as a person and the family as a whole, like how the dynamic works. There's no exposure to healthy outside influences. So there, if there's no exposure and no accountability, there's no growth. There's emotional blackmail. For example, family members, so for example, family members use guilt. They use emotional manipulation or threats of abandonment to control each other's behavior. So there's this sense of obligation that that you must prioritize the family's needs over your own well-being. That's what comes up this time of year all the time. That you're supposed to subvert what you need and go home for Christmas. And you can't have any boundaries and you don't have any say in how all that goes. And it's really hard for people to say, I'm not staying at the house, or I'm only coming for a day or two, or I can't come this year, or I'm not spending the night. And in a mesh family, that's like treason. You can't do that. They take it as such a rejection because people who struggle with boundaries make it all about them, and they take it as a rejection as opposed to, oh, my adult child wants to spend time with their own family and not travel for a day to get here. Imagine that. There's often shared identity, so family members may not have a strong sense of individual identity apart from their family. What that looks like is their personal goals, their aspirations, and often their interests are subsumed by the collective family identity, what your family wants to do on the weekend, not what you want to do on the weekend. So there's a real difficulty establishing healthy independence because there's fear about the potential disruption of the close family ties. No one wants to be the bad guy blowing up the family. I don't care how messed up that family is. Moving away, pursuing individual goals, or making personal decisions 
are probably going to be met with resistance. So a lot of times people don't even try. There's often intense emotional boundaries. So for example, emotional boundaries between family members are blurred. So you can't even tell your own feelings from the feelings of others. And we talked about that a moment ago. So if your sister is really upset about a situation with your mom, even if you don't feel the same way, you may hesitate to not support her and be mad too, even though you might secretly see the situation differently. And the big one, resistance to change. Any attempt by a family member to create distance or set individual goals is met with resistance or fear. Because change is seen as a threat. It's a threat to the stability of the enmeshed dynamic. The family wants to stay sick. And I have seen amazing things over the years when I would be helping a client get healthier and therefore need some distance from their very unhealthy family. And what went down? The family would often, when I worked in treatment, be trying to sabotage their daughter's sobriety. They would sabotage any efforts of counseling that I'd be doing with a teenager or a young adult because they saw it as a threat. Because if you get healthier and you leave the family, they have to look in the mirror. And that is terrifying for a lot of people. Everything will have to change and they're not ready for things to change. So another area is inconsistent discipline. Inconsistent or overly harsh discipline, like we talked about, can really confuse kids about what's appropriate, what are good boundaries. And when there's a lack of clear consequences for actions, they're really going to struggle with cause and effect and probably manipulate to get needs met and probably have a hard time maturing in their life. So here are some examples of what we mean by that inconsistent discipline. First one is mixed messages. That's what we talked about earlier, where one day behavior is okay and the next day it's not because mom's in a bad mood or she's tired or dad's stressed. And that creates eggshells on the floor and got just a low level PTSD for the kids because they never know what's going to happen. So this isn't just about boundaries. You could even dare say it lends itself to creating some post-traumatic stress and certainly, certainly a lack of trust in the parent. And that lack of trust also comes from a lack of follow-through. This is the most common. So a parent will threaten a consequence for a specific behavior, but they won't follow through consistently. So then the kid just questions credibility of whatever the parent says. They don't believe it. None of us believe it unless it really happens. It's not real until the boundary comes down. It's not real until the toy is taken away. It's not real until the TV gets turned off. That's what makes it real. There are variable standards. Maybe there are different standards of behavior applied to different kids in the family. That creates so much confusion and resentment and acting out and anxiety. It turns the siblings on each other. Not good. It also can wreck trust in the parent from the kid who is more severely punished or when they see mom and or dad not dealing with a sibling who is really getting away with some really bad behavior. That happens in workplaces too. We know that. Think about what that does to morale. The parents' emotional responses are inconsistent. So it oftentimes, instead of being based on what the child did, is based on the parents' emotional state. Like maybe they're more lenient when they're in a good mood and harsh when they're stressed out and have had a really shitty day. That's not good because that's leaking it out on the kid. There are unclear expectations. So kids aren't sure about the expectations and consequences for certain behaviors because the rules are not clearly communicated or consistently applied. And this leads to mom and or dad making it up as they go and being very reactive in their parenting. So the kid doesn't know, but they know you're pissed. They know they've let you down. 
and that's all they know. So we're just creating shame-based kids when we're doing this. This inconsistency goes to rewards, too. A parent rewards a behavior with positive reinforcement one day, but then ignores it the next day. So there's uncertainty. And the biggest uncertainty is about the relationship between the kid's behavior and the outcomes. Remember, we're growing grown-ups here. We're trying to provide for them a microcosm of what the big bad world looks like when they leave the home. Maybe there's conditional discipline. So it's inconsistently applied based on the child's perceived popularity or success, sending the message that some siblings are exempt from the rules. That makes the other kids feel very unsafe. It gives that kid a sense of entitlement, and the others have resentment and lack of trust. Another common one is is when parents are overly strict, but then they follow that up with, permissiveness. That leaves the kid uncertain about what the boundaries are and the expectations. That's the parent's issue emotionally, where they came down hard and they can't handle it. So then they try to compensate for that because the guilt kicks in. Maybe there are arbitrary punishments. That's very common. So the consequences are so arbitrary and unrelated to the behavior that just went down. So the kid is just confused and frustrated and they can't predict the outcomes of their actions, which is what we want them to do. That's how we grow grown-ups. Those are some examples of inconsistent parenting and how it creates so much confusion and anxiety, but also distrust in the parents. That's why you see kids will do really well with certain teachers in certain classrooms and come home and be a mess. And you find out that those teachers, they don't blow up and yell and scream, but they're very clear about the rules and they're very consistent with their rules and they follow through without shaming and guilting the child so the child can learn to maneuver in the classroom and choose their behaviors. And the teacher just follows through. Nope, you don't have recess. You didn't finish your work you were cutting up in class. And the kid knows that and they learn how to trust it. Then they choose from there. So both overprotective parenting and neglectful parenting can really impact a kid's ability to develop healthy boundaries. Because overprotected kids are going to struggle with independence, but neglected children may not have their boundaries acknowledged or respected. So the typical one, and you know what I'm going to say, is helicopter parenting. That's when a parent hovers way too much over their kid's every move, constantly intervening in their activities and decisions, and they're not allowing the child to experience age-appropriate challenges, to figure things out, you know, to figure out friendships at eight years old. They need to. Not that the parent shouldn't be there for support and guidance, certainly but they're allowing the kid to think about things and make some decisions and fall down and get hurt when they're learning to ride a bike and get back up. Maybe there's excessive monitoring. A parent excessively monitors the the kid's friendships and online activities and whereabouts. Now, I'm not saying parents shouldn't have some sense of what's going on for sure, but these should be age-appropriate. There's an avoidance of risk. So the parent, out of fear, shields the kid from any potential risk or discomfort, like maybe avoiding sports or activities that might involve physical challenges, maybe the possibility of failure. So the parent is not doing the kid any favors by protecting them from being hurt. It's hard to find that fine line for parents because, of course, parents out there, we care about our kids. Maybe there's micromanaging schoolwork. So a parent excessively involves themselves in the kid's academic responsibilities, maybe doing their homework or projects, making sure their success without allowing the kid to develop those study skills themselves, to own it. Maybe there's emotional overprotection where you're protecting the kid from any negative emotions or experiences, protecting them from facing disappointment or failure 
And that's not good because that's how you become emotionally resilient is you learn how to fail and get back up again. A more common one is decision-making control. That's when the parent tries to make all the decisions for the child from choosing their extracurricular activities to deciding on their friendships, not allowing the kid to make any choices. Maybe they want to shelter them from reality. They don't want to talk about real-world issues. They avoid discussions about hard topics like diversity, adversity, maybe things going on in the world. So that's the overly involved parent. But what about neglectful parenting? Physical neglect, I think we know more about, where the parent fails to provide basic needs like food, clothing, a safe living environment. Maybe there's physical harm. Maybe mom has had someone move in that's abusive. Maybe there's emotional neglect. When a parent is emotionally distant and unresponsive to the kid's emotional needs. So dinner's on the table and there's clothes on their back and there's a roof over their head. But there's no comfort or support or acknowledgement or mirroring or hugs just because. Maybe there's a lack of supervision. Maybe the parent consistently leaves a young child unsupervised for extended periods. Puts that kid at risk of accidents or harm or crazy stuff happening. Free-range children. Maybe there's educational neglect, so a parent fails to enroll the child in school or doesn't care about their homework or doesn't ask how their day was or maybe make sure there's poster board for the project kind of thing. Appropriate involvement. And along with this is failure to provide guidance. Kids need guidance. They need to know how to do stuff. Maybe there's no expectations for the kid's behavior. They don't even know what appropriate behavior is. They may know it at school, but they don't know it at home. Maybe there's inconsistent care, and we'll talk more about that in the next episode, where the parent is inconsistently available. Maybe they're meeting their child's needs and other times neglecting them. So there's a real lack of stability and predictability. And kids need that to feel secure. No parent is perfect and life happens, but if the parent doesn't commit to making sure that first things first, I'm going to show up for my kid as best I can. There's a balance between being overprotective and neglectful, and that's the key to fostering healthy development in children. And it's not easy, but I think that if we can stay out of the extremes, we're doing an okay job. So that was a lot. That was a lot of information about what a lack of boundaries looks like in parenting and how that can impact the child. Remember, again, families are our first classrooms where we learn how to say no, how to hear no, how to accept no, how to know where we end and others begin. And our parents taught us that or didn't. And our families modeled it or didn't. So how much of what was mentioned today resonated with you, do you think? Have you maybe already identified much of this and already begun to work on it? Or is this new? Or maybe you're in the middle. You just got started recently, but like an archaeology project, you're unearthing more and more as you go, which is normal. What impacts do you see in your current life today that make more sense now? Like maybe you struggle with making decisions and when you look back at your family, you may understand why. Because kids need to hear at the dinner table from the grown-ups, well, what do you think about that? How do you think you want to solve that problem? Or that's a really great idea. Or that makes sense that you feel that way. How can you trust yourself to make decisions as a grown-up? If for years and years, your thoughts and feelings and needs were not valued and validated. And many loving families would love to validate you, but it's too vulnerable and they don't know how. So today we identified several different ways that the family you grew up in may have shaped your boundaries. Then we explored a bunch of factors within family dynamics that can really contribute to that lack of clear understanding of what healthy boundaries are. 
So by dissecting some of these important aspects, trying to look at how your perception of boundaries was shaped as a child and how you've learned to operate in your relationships as you've gotten older. So in the next episode, we're going to get even more into this, especially the deeper chaos that I think can really wreak havoc on a child's ability to have and or set limits in their life. So we talked about more benign stuff today, I think. Next week's going to be a little heavier. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. I hope if things resonated, that they were helpful. If you need help, if you need coaching, if you need support, First of all, get the course, because if you struggle to set boundaries and maybe have some serious sorting to do when it comes to your childhood, even if you think you've already done some work, know that you can't do this work alone because no one can. Grab the course, join the online coaching class where you can get that support. I watch in the class, people really support each other and help each other grow. And it's just really, really important. If you want to make changes for a healthier, happier, more confident you, you have to reach out for support. All right, so pay it forward, keep focusing on you, and I'll see you next time. We hope you took away some useful insights and tools you can begin using right away. If you did, please leave a positive review and share on your social media. Because could you imagine if everyone in your life really got it together? Remember, own it now, so you can really own it later.